Welcome to Class 1 of Financial Analytics. In this topic, we'll be looking at banking and financial institutions. The outline is as follows. What is a bank? What constitutes a bank's portfolio? The banking structure in India, the U.S., and the Bank for International Settlement. The Profit Cycle of a Bank By definition, what is a bank? There are people in the economy who have extra money. They go and keep this money in the institution called a bank, and the bank gives them some interest on this money. The bank further lends out the money to a set of people who have a requirement for money. These people are ready to pay the bank interest to get their hands on this money. Thus, the bank is an intermediary between these two types of people in the economy. The bank connects customers that have capital deficits to customers with capital surpluses. According to Britannica.com, a bank is an institution that deals in money, and it substitutes and provides other financial services. Bank accepts deposits and makes loans, and they derive a profit from the difference in the interest rates paid and charged, respectively. Banks are critical to our economy. The primary function of a bank is to put the account holder's money to use by lending it out to others who can use it to buy homes, businesses, send kids to college, etc. When you deposit your money in the bank, it goes into a big pool of money, along with everyone else's, and your account is credited with the amount of your deposit. When you write checks, the amount is deducted from your account balance, and any interest you earn on your balance is added to your account. Now we see that banks act as intermediaries. What would happen if you didn't use banks as an intermediary? In that situation, the fund holders would have invested directly in the markets, the capital markets or the bullion market. Buyers of funds would have got their financing from these markets, and a lot of people do work like this. What constitutes a bank's portfolio? Money lent to customers and all loans that are earning assets for the bank come under the assets category. Any money borrowed from the customers or money on which the bank has to pay interest come under the liability category. These include fixed deposits and current bank accounts. Secured loans and unsecured loans are the two types of assets that banks have. Secured loans are backed with some kind of collateral. What is collateral? Collateral is a house, an LIC policy, or anything against which the bank gives the loan. In case of a default, i.e., if we do not pay the loan back to the bank, the bank will sell this asset and get back its money. The ideal scenario is that close to 85% of the bank's portfolio should be secured loans. If the rate of interest ranges between 10 to 14%, like it does in India, and the tenure is high, the banks will lend this money out for a long time. Then there are unsecured loans. Unsecured loans, as the name suggests, means that they do not have any collateral and hence, in the event of default, no asset can be attached. The ideal scenario is that the maximum tenure of unsecured loans will be around five years, much lower than the tenure or the time period which the bank is ready to give out secured loans. The return on investment will be much higher. It's 14 to 20 percent in India. This is because the risk is much higher as there is no backup, no surety. Most banks will have a maximum cap on the loan amount, and again, this cap will not be very high, so one cannot take too many unsecured loans. Now the savings bank account gives you the lowest interest rate. Why is this? Because this is money on call. You can take out the money at your convenience. The bank is not sure how long that money will stay with it whereas the fixed maturity plans get higher interest rates because there is a reward for the certainty. The certainty is at least 80% of the customers will not take out the money before the fixed time for which they have put in the money. The funny thing about how a bank works is that it functions because of our trust. We give our bank the money to keep it safe for us, and then the bank turns around and gives it to someone else in order to make money for itself. Banks can legally extend considerably more credit than they have cash. How do banks create money? We trust the bank will have our money for us when we go back and get it. 
we trust that it will honor the checks we write to pay our bills. The thing that's hard to grasp is the fact that while people are putting money into the bank every day, the bank is lending the same money and more to other people every day. Banks consistently extend more credit than they have cash. That's a bit scary, but if you go to the bank and demand your money, you'll get it. Banks are just like other businesses. Their product just happens to be money. Other businesses sell goods or services. Banks sell money in the form of loans and certificates of deposit and other financial products. They make money on the interest they charge on loans because the interest is higher than the interest they pay on depositors' accounts. The fractional reserve system is how banks make money. Banks create money in the economy by making loans. The amount of money that banks can lend is set by the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and the RBI in India. The reserve requirement is, say, 10% of the bank's total deposits. This amount can either be held in cash on hand or with the bank's reserve account with the central bank. For example, when a bank gets a deposit of 100 rupees, assuming a reserve requirement of 10%, the bank can then lend out 90 rupees. That 90 rupees goes back into the economy, purchasing goods or services, and usually ends up deposited in another bank. This second bank can lend out 81 rupees out of the deposit of 90 rupees, and that 81 goes out into the economy to purchase goods or services, and ultimately is deposited into another bank that proceeds to lend out a percentage of this. In this way, money grows and flows through the community in a greater amount than it physically exists. That 100 rupees makes a much larger ripple in the economy than you may realize. This is how it works, not only in India, but also in the U.S. So how do banks process checks? When we go and deposit a check, our bank encodes it, endorses it, and sends it to the reserve bank of the region or a private clearinghouse. When the check makes its way to the regional reserve bank or clearinghouse, a recon is done. How much money is moving from bank A to bank B? How much money is moving from bank B to bank A? They look at it cumulatively across all the checks that have come in for a clearing that day. Then, in the recon ledger, whatever is the difference, say if bank A owes some money to bank B, that small fraction is the only money which will exchange hands between the banks. That's how banks process our checks. Now let's look at the banking structure in India, the U.S. First of all, banking structure in India. In India, the Apex Bank is the Reserve Bank of India. The other types of banks which work in our economy are commercial banks, cooperative banks, and development banks. These are the three broad categories of banks. We will deal extensively only with the commercial banks because cooperative banks and development banks have very strict charters, and their main aim may not always be to make profits since they may have been established for special purposes. Commercial banks can be of two types, nationalized and private. The largest nationalized bank is the State Bank of India, and in the private sector we have HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, Axis, etc. Banking Structure in the U.S. United States of America has a Board of Governors which oversees the Federal Open Market Committee. This Federal Open Market Committee monitors the Federal Reserve Banks, and then you have member banks and other depository institutions, just like in India. There you have NBFCs, which report into the Federal Reserve Banks and are monitored by the Federal Reserve Banks. The American people deposit their money with these member banks and other depository institutions, which are all commercial institutions. The Federal Reserve System You have 12 Federal Reserve Banks, and they have 25 branches. Some 343,000 member banks are regulated by these 25 Federal Reserve branches. The Federal Reserve Banks are monitored by the Board of Governors. Let's look at the Bank of International Settlement. All of us have heard of Basel, right? Basel is a city in Switzerland. The bank has representative offices in Hong Kong and Mexico City. The Basel II Accords are the most popular as of now, though the Basel III Accords are up for implementation from 2013 onwards. The Bank of International Settlements is an international organization which fosters international monitoring and financial cooperation, 
and serves as a bank for central banks. The Basel fulfills its mandate by acting as a forum for discussion and decision-making amongst the central banks and within the international and supervisory community. It also acts as a center for economic and monetary research, a primary counterparty for central banks and their financial transactions, and as an agent or trustee in connection with financial operations. It was established on the 17th of May, 1930, and is the world's oldest international financial organization. The Basel Accords have to be followed by banks, and we, as clients of these commercial banks, are affected when the bank brings in policies to implement the Basel Accords. The Basel III Accords are supposed to come into implementation from 2013 onwards. Lastly, let's look at the profit cycle for a commercial bank. 1. Banks are just like other businesses. Their product just happens to be money. The interest rate a bank charges its borrowers depends on both a. the number of people who want to borrow and b. the amount of money the bank has available to lend. So it will accept deposits at a lower interest rate and it gives loans at a higher interest rate because loaning money is inherently risky. A bank never really knows if it will get that money back. Therefore, the riskier the loan, the higher interest rate that the bank charges. While paying interest may not seem to be a great financial move in some respects, it really is a small price to pay for using someone else's money. So the prevalence of loans has actually increased in our economy. 2. Banking fees. Banks also charge fees for services like checking, ATM access, and overdraft. Loans have their own fees that go with them. Some of the common fees are application fees, commissions, penalty charges, account fees, etc. 3. Low-risk investments. Bank earn returns on investments they make. Bank financing and fees comprises most of a bank's profits, but there is one more strategy that they employ. As many businesses do, banks attempt to maximize profits by making their own investments that they are hopeful will earn them good returns. However, they cannot simply make any purchase they wish. Banks must keep a certain amount of deposits liquid at all times. This is defined by the banking governance rules. They must invest primarily in loans. Any other ventures they decide to invest in have to be very low risk. To recap, we understood what a bank is and its portfolio. We studied the banking structure in India, the USA, and the Bank of International Settlement. We also looked at the profit cycle of a bank. That's it for this topic. For any queries, do email us at info at jigsawacademy.com. Thanks.